What's up, guys? Rick here with your DFS preview for this week's Masters. And that is sure good to say we have finally made the first major championship of the year. Our Super Bowl, our Holy Grail, it is here. And I am going to take you through the golf course, the field, the stats. We're going to do a lot of data-driven research. I'm going to use my website, rickrungood.com, which has a bunch of new updates for the custom model that will allow you to create all the lineups you could ever dream of and get the best edge for this week. I'm sick of waiting. Let's jump into it. Augusta National is here. And this is the course key stats model at rickrungood.com. So for those of you who are new, this is a correlation model that compares all the available stats on the PGA Tour. And it looks at the results for every single golf course and it finds what stats are most important. It basically builds types of golfers. What types of golfers have had success at these different golf courses? And you probably don't need me to tell you that Augusta National is going to be a true test of golf. It is going to be demanding through every single facet. It is going to be hard to fake your way around here. It's going to be hard to win with a flaw in your game. It's going to challenge you all over the place. You're going to need to be well-rounded. But there's a couple of things that we're going to need to take into consideration right out of the gate here. So um, off the tee, if you are able to shape the ball in both directions, you're more likely to have success at Augusta National. The longer, the better. In fact, driving distance ranks six. That means there's only five other courses on the PGA Tour schedule in which driving distance is more important. It doesn't mean you have to hit it far. It just means that guys that do tend to have more success relative at Augusta National than other golf courses. That's what that means. So, especially with the lengthening of number 13, maybe guys are hitting more drivers there. Driving distance could even become more important this time around, but we're still going to see. That hole was lengthened, what, 35? Five yards, so we'll see how it how it shapes up. Approach play is always critical, but skews more important here at Augusta National. It's 13th, which means there's only 12 other courses in which strokes gained approach is more important. Strokes gained approach and strokes gained putting actually have a little bit of a unique connection this week, which is not always the case on the PGA Tour. There are so many great green complexes at Augusta National that if you are not able to hit the proper tier, the proper spot on these greens with your second shot, it is going to make the difficulty of your putts much harder. And that's not always the case at courses that we see week in and week out. So I'll give you a really good example. If you're playing the Sunday pin at 16, down in that bowl in the in kind of the back left there where everything in the middle funnels over and you can see that's where you see the hole in ones or holes in one. That's where you see uh, the really close shots. You see all of that, right? If you hit it all up to like the back right or the right hand side, if you're up on that upper plateau, it doesn't matter how good of a putter you are because you are putting straight downhill and you're never going to be able to stop it. So there are a lot of situations like that around this golf of course, where your approach play almost, it doesn't determine how your putts are going to be, but there is a much stronger connection here than a lot of other places. And strokes gained approach is always one of the most correlated stats, continues to be correlated here. What else do you see? Strokes gained around the green, seventh. That means there's only six other courses in which strokes gained around the green is more important. Now, its value is almost half of that of strokes gained approach. Strokes gained, strokes gained approach is always valuable. But relative, the rank, where you have to be stout with the short game here at Augusta National, uh, bar none, right? You are going to be in a lot of awkward spots if you miss these greens. You are going to be in a lot of tight lies. You are going to have to get creative. You're going to have to have every single shot, right? We saw Scotty Scheffler really tap into his short game and his around the green play last year. And he also, especially on Sunday, right? That early chip in, which kind of stopped a little bit of the bleeding for him on Sunday, like probably turns the tide. He probably wins the golf tournament because of that shot alone. Obviously, that's 
one shot, but his, his short game is phenomenal. So you put all three of those together, and and what do you notice here? You know, strokes gained tee to green is number two, which means there's only one other course on the PGA Tour schedule in which strokes gained tee to green is more valuable. Strokes gained putting doesn't pop here. But what you'll need to know about strokes game putting is on these bent grass greens, which they try to run very fast, these are nuanced green complexes. Okay, the experience tends to go a long way here. You know, we saw, what did we see? Sunday night, Tiger Woods showed up. Sunday night the, before, you know, Monday of Masters week, and he walked the front nine. And what did he do? He didn't take driver. He didn't take three iron. He didn't do it. He took his putter and a handful of wedges, and he walked around and hit a bunch of different short game shots uh, to all those different greens. Because these green complexes are so unique, and you have to have so much experience. He hit putts to where he knows those pins are going to be. It is such an experienced a uh, golf course or a golf course where experience really, really lends itself to success. So that's what I think you need on the putting surface is not just saying, Hey, he, here are the best putters. There is also, um, a really good conversation that we had on the First Cut podcast last night, Greg Ducharme and Kyle Porter about defensive putters there. I, 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 I stress you go back and listen to it. We probably had an eight or 12 minute rant. I'll just recap the whole thing here. And Greg Ducharme nailed it. And, and and basically when you get greens that are fast and pure and without friction, like Scotty Scheffler has talked about in the past, being a defensive putter at Augusta national allows you to kind of, um, succeed on these putting greens, right? You know, a lot of putts go in the hole at three o'clock and four o'clock where on slower greens, that just doesn't happen because there's not that extra drip. There's not that extra roll. So think about guys who are defensive putters, Bubba Watson, very defensive putter. You know, we, we, we started that conversation because of Corey Connors. Corey Connors is a very defensive putter and has, and has putted great at Augusta national in his career. It's, it's obviously not the only way to get it done. You know, Phil Mickelson, um, a very aggressive putter, Putter, for example, but th I'm trying to paint a picture of the types of golfers that could have more success than others this week. And when you put all of this together, long off the tee with the ability to work it both ways, uh, a stout uh, second shot, precision with your second shot, a handy and tidy short game and experience on the putting greens, that is is the golfer that is going to win and don a green jacket come Sunday evening. Now, if we look at that from a statistical sense, so this course key stats model allows you to plug in any number of rounds that you want and see how those uh, models up top and, and the stats from the number of rounds that you have chosen, how those all come together and they give you an adjusted fit number. Scotty Scheffler's number one. That's right. Yeah, a 5.8 adjusted fit. Essentially, his skill set over the last 36 overlaid to what we have deemed to be important mathematically, he gets the biggest boost or his game fits it the best. Mito Pereira, number two, Terrell Hatton, three, Jason Day, four, Patrick Cantlay, five, John Rahm, Kevin Knob, believe it or not, Rory McIlroy, Tony Finau, Keith Mitchell, Victor Hovland, Justin Thomas, Will Zalatoris, so on and so forth. So um, you can mess around with this. You can adjust any number of rounds that you want, but but this is a really cool way to look at everything and say, okay, now that we know what we have up top, who does that actually fit? As opposed to just looking at the eye test, we can actually put numbers behind it as well. Um, let's head over to the cheat sheet and start talking about these golfers individually. Because this pricing came out so early, we do have the first run of projected ownerships on rickrungood.com. So Mike Cavalunas, who's been crushing the ownership numbers um, this year, has them out already. And you'll see um, them change over the course of uh, the week uh, many times throughout the week. You'll also be able to see that here on the cheat sheet, so uh, or excuse me, on the custom model for you guys who saw it last week. So we have the first run is going to be loaded in, and then anytime it changes, you'll see the, the direction that uh, those numbers are moving in, which is a really, really cool way to keep track of everything. Only three golfers over $10,000. Scotty Scheffler is 11-1. John Rahm is 10-8. Roy McIlroy is 10.6. And there is a pretty big gap between them and the rest of the field. Now, this is um, this is reflected in the in the betting market. These two have the or these three have the the three shortest odds, and then there's a pretty big gap to everybody else. So we should probably talk about them um, individually here. Now, before I do that, let me show you these guys together. So uh, this is the power rankings. 
I wanted to get a feel for who the best long-term tee to green players in this field are. So I said, you know what? Just open this thing up. Give me the last 100 rounds for everybody in this field. Let's um, get a, a really good picture of just who the best players are. 100 rounds is a long time. It's basically a year for most of these guys. And there are two guys that stand alone, and they are both in this $10,000 range. It is Scotty Scheffler and it is Rory McIlroy. They're gaining 2.08 and 2.03 strokes per round from tee to green, respectively. That's impressive. Even more impressive is the gap they have on everyone else. There is not another golfer in this field who's gaining 1.5 per round. So these two guys, head and shoulders, a half a stroke better per round. That gap is the same gap from... Rory to Finau, two to three, as Finau down to Mito Pereira, who's like 20th, okay? So these two are absolutely lapping the field. I'll, I'll just kind of get this out of the way early. I, I believe Scotty Scheffler is going to win this, right? Like if you put my feet to the fire and you said, who's going to win this golf tournament? And you said, only pick one. I don't care about his price. I don't care about his odds. I don't care about anything else. I would pick Scotty Scheffler. Um, that is not a knock on anybody else. I just love this phenomenal tee to green play that he has been doing for basically 18 months. His around the green play, his short game in general is phenomenal. The putter is getting better and it's still not that hot. I, I like look back at what Scotty was doing in the midst of his four wins in, in six starts uh, last year, including that culminating with a master's victory. He was tee to greening these golf courses to death and gaining multiple strokes with the putter. He is still gaining uh, tee to greening these golf courses to death. He went through this putting slump here from the Scottish Open to the CJ Cup, and now he's getting back on the right side of things, right? The Players' Championship, he makes like a what? What, what, he, what was that putt on the 72nd hole? Um, 18 feet? Was it longer than that? Whatever it was. That took him from a losing putter for the week to a winning putter for the week. So just point one one with the putter at the Players' Championship, and that's all he needs, right? I mean, that's that's the impressive stuff. All he needs is to gain, like, maybe a half a stroke with the putter. If he gains three or four, watch out. It might be a, a route like we saw last year. I will note, so I do have the strokes gain breakdown for a couple of years at the Masters. Augusta National doesn't give us this. I, this has to be calculated ourselves, but it's calculated shot by shot. So you'll see I've got the 2022, 2021, and 2019 data loaded in. I've got to get the 2020 stuff calculated. It's a big process, but I've got the breakdown for three out of the last four years, which we can look at um, on rickrungood.com. I've got the uh, the live stuff. I've got the European tour stuff. I've got six tours. So it's 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 all in there. It's pretty comprehensive when you get to a major championship. It's it's really, really important. So um, I'm basically of the mindset that Scotty Scheffler is going to win this golf tournament. I think if you ask me for a, a, a an option B, it's Rory McIlroy. Now, I love doing the data stuff, but Rory is a very introspective golfer and he's very aware of a lot of things. And he's very, very aware that he is trying to go and complete the career grand slam. And he has been very candid about sometimes knowing that is not a great thing, right? And it's, and it's why sometimes on Thursdays at major championships, he's gotten off to a little bit of a rough start. But what, what are we looking at statistically here? Rory McIlroy made some changes in his bag recently, put a new driver in the bag, put a new putter in the bag. Well, gaining eight and a half strokes, off the tee at the match play is phenomenal stuff. Drove it like crazy. You can gain a lot at Austin Country Club because of the way the drives are and stuff like that, and match play is a little bit wonky, but these are the real numbers. He drove it like a maniac. He also gained 2.3 strokes with the putter. Um, his largest gain since his win in Dubai on the European Tour and his largest gain uh, on the PGA Tour since his win at the CJ Cup. You see a trend here? I'm looking for guys that when they gain two strokes putting are going to win. Not guys that have to gain four or five strokes putting to contend. I want guys that only have to roll the rock a little bit to win. You look at Rory McIlroy and what he has done at Augusta National. Obviously, not a victory on the resume, but that that surge on Sunday to get a runner-up finish last year. The T5 in 2020, T21, T5, T7, T10, T4, T8. That's all consecutively. 
I mean, wakes out of wakes up out of bed, rolls out of bed, finishes inside the top ten at Augusta National. Probably playing the best golf of his career right now. Is that fair to say? I think it is. There's a lot of really good moments of of Rory McIlroy, but this this might be the best. And then John Rahm, you know, I feel bad, right? I I, I there's there is nothing wrong with John Rahm. Um, I don't love what he did at the match play. I'm willing to throw that out the window. He generally bounces back quite quite quickly. Um, he usually uses bad performances for fuel. We are only a couple of starts removed from an unbelievable victory where he gained 12 and a half strokes ball striking at Riviera. I, I, I followed him a lot on this West Coast stretch, and he was totally locked in. It did not even feel like there was a chance he was ever going to lose, and he barely did, right? Wins the Tournament of Champions, wins the American Express, T7 at Torrey, third at Phoenix. I thought he was going to win in Phoenix until the 70th hole, and then a win at Riviera. I'm. We just have to split hairs here at the top, and unfortunately, Rom is the hair that gets split here because otherwise he's a phenomenal option. The 9K range, how good is this, right? Cam Smith, Jordan Spieth, Patrick Cantlay, Justin Thomas, Max Homa, Colin Morikawa, Xander Shoffley. You can make the case for any single one of them, right? I, I know that Augusta National is some of the stickiest course history, meaning that guys that tend to have success year over year or tend to have success have it year over year. Guys that don't uh, tend not to you usually get a, a very similar field, a similar size field. Conditions are, are they don't change all that much. Augusta National has a really good job, does a really good job of kind of keeping it consistent year in and year out. So it makes sense. Here's Cam Smith. Now, we got to talk about the live guys, and I do wonder, we're already kind of seeing it. So Mike Cavalunas' first run of projected ownership has Cam Smith as the most, uh, the highest owned golfer in the 9K range. And I wonder if that's just because people haven't had a chance to play him, right? You know, unless you're playing the live contest, which aren't nearly as big on DraftKings as um, anything else, you know, you really haven't had an opportunity to play Cam Smith. So I, I think there is going to be this shiny new object in the rear view saying, oh yeah, I'll, I'll click that name. But um, how do we assess these guys? And, and this is going to be a problem that's not unique to Cam Smith. Cam Smith has gone T5 in Mayakoba, Live Golf, uh, 24th in Tucson, 26th in Orlando. I ask you, is that good? Is that bad? Should we be impressed or not? So we gained six and a half strokes to the field at Mayakoba. And then his last two starts, he has been uh, field average in a on a tour that is clearly a weaker tour than um, than the PGA Tour and especially a major championship field, so it it's hard to be super optimistic, right? I I don't know. I think that there are going to be some opportunities for guys like maybe Brooks Kepka who is coming off a win in Orlando, or even like a Joaquin Neem and guys that are priced a little bit better. What I don't love about Cam Smith, Cam Smith's situation is that he is popular and expensive. I would prefer like one or the other. I would, I, I just, I just don't think either one of those are going to work. If he flips the switch and gets back to playing great and, and doing it at Augusta national, more power to him. I'd be very excited for him, but I, I think we're going to find some live guys later that are, um, much better suited game theory wise or roster construction wise. The other thing is Cam's miss off the tee when he misses is left. It's usually a big miss left. We saw it a lot on Sunday in the final round last year when he was playing with Scotty Scheffler. You cannot miss left at Augusta National. You just can't. And I do worry about that a little bit. Same thing with Bryson that of years past, right? That was something we talked about with him. When he misses, he misses left, and that's horrible. Um, I worry about that for Cam Smith here. A couple of these other guys in the middle. I'm... I'm I'm here. I'm here for the Jordan Speed stuff, right? I mean, let let's look at the Holy Grail. Let's go to you know everybody in this field dating back to uh, 2012, and we will say at the Masters, and we'll just look at um, look at the course history here. There are guys with smaller sample sizes that have been better than Jordan Spieth, but nobody's been better than Spieth in the in the sample size that he has. So Zalatoris has gained nearly three shots per round in eight rounds. Uh, Scheffler has gained 2.26 in 
excuse me, I shouldn't say, oh yeah, in eight rounds. Uh, Scheffler's done it in 12 rounds. Spieth has done the same thing Scotty has ha has done in three times as many rounds. Think about that. Scotty Scheffler has gone win, T18, T19. He's gaining 2.26 strokes per round, an insane number. Spieth has kept the same rate in three times as many rounds, 34 rounds. It feels like he has three green jackets, he has one. Also, I know that you don't get another green jacket if you win. That's just a nice, fun thing to say. You only, you only, fun fact, you only, no matter how many you win, you only get one green jacket. You get multiple trophies, but you only get one green jacket. And you look at you know the three years of strokes gain metrics that we have, good ball striking numbers, around the green play. Actually, in, in each of the last two years, he's lost strokes with the putter. Now, that is kind of a little bit of a spell that Spieth has been in, I, I would say, and he's starting to get out of that. He's starting to putt a little bit better right now. If you look at what he did at match play, he lost a stroke and a half, but the three starts before that, so his last three strokes, stroke play events, he gained in each one of those, including four and a half at the Valspar. He is a guy who thrives in the uncomfortable, right? Augusta National makes you uncomfortable, makes everybody uncomfortable. There's an aura about it. Um, there's a feel about it. It's already uncomfortable. Then you get no even lie around this place, right? Um, the ball is above your feet. The ball is below your feet. Your side hill, whatever. Like, it's just never flat. It's a lot like Kapalua. Jordan Spieth also thrives at Kapalua, by the way. So for someone who's constantly uncomfortable and who can thrive in uncomfortable, it makes sense that Jordan Spieth has had, had such great success around here. And the way that he's playing coming into this with a couple of really great finishes, like, yeah, I'm... I'll, I'll fall for this one. I'll step on the rake, smack me in the face, all that fun stuff. Um, Cantley's probably the most intriguing golfer because on paper, there is no golf course in the world that should give Patrick Cantley trouble. There is no event in the world that should give him trouble. Now, he's, this is going to be what, his 24th major championship. He's only got, I think, three top tens. He's only had really one contention. His best contending week, I believe, probably would have been 19 here at the Masters. But... Look at what he's doing, and 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 I think it's noteworthy to see how well he's hitting it, gaining four and a half strokes, five and a half strokes, 5.83 off the tee, approach numbers, two and a half or more in each of his last four, especially because he's an equipment-free agent, right? So he's using the equipment he wants to use, and you're seeing gains like this. That is really, really impressive. Now, the big one has eluded him. The big one has eluded Patrick Cantlay. You look at his results here at the Masters. It was that T9 in 2019. That was his best finish. He's missed the cut twice in six years. 39th here last year. It's not particularly great. He lost five and a half strokes putting here last year over four rounds. He's lost the combat. He's lost basically 10 strokes putting in his last two trips. Is that bad play? Is it he is he learning the greens, right? Is something going to click for him? That that's kind of the question. So I think he's he's kind of the X factor here for me. I would not be I honestly wouldn't be surprised if he finished 50th and I wouldn't be surprised if he won. Um the rest of this range there's not a ton to talk about here. I think Justin Thomas is not a great option. I think he's a good option. I worry about his putter. It has not been good. It is something that I think is 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 um hindering him in other aspects of his game, but he gained strokes putting here last year about 2.8. He gained a one stroke putting in 2021. Um he lost five and a half in 2019, but we can let that alone. We are seeing some some improvements again on the approach play and he's got one of the most underrated short games in the world around the green. So I'm warming on JT. I'm probably like a seven out of 10. You know, if I'm a, if I'm a nine out of 10 on speed and a 10 out of 10 on Scotty, I'm like a six and a half or a seven out of 10 on Justin Thomas. I think that uh, if you wanted to play Xander, if you wanted to play Homa, that's fine. I'm interested to see what Colin Morikawa is going to do. Um, and, and if this ownership is going to, allow us to get a pretty good deal on him. So he doesn't get out of his group at the match play, but he played fine at the match play. Was elite on approach at TPC Sawgrass. Nine strokes gained on approach. He's gaining again frequently there. Uh, the around the green play has been much better. Let's look at what he's done at the Masters. Can, can you know, on, on Wednesday, when we do what is likely to be the, the absolute biggest live chat we've ever done. I don't think that's an exaggeration. I think last year's Masters was the biggest live chat we have done at that point. I imagine this Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern time, Rick Run Good YouTube channel is going to be the biggest live chat we've ever done. 
we're going to know a lot more about the projected ownership of Colin Morikawa. And for a guy who's gone 44th, T8, and 5th in his three trips, who has gained strokes putting in each of his last two, even if it was less than one in each one of those, that's a really good sign. So let me see if I can get Colin Morikawa at a number. I don't know if that's going to be the case, but I want to try to find out. Before we jump into the 8K range, I do want to load up uh, basically like strokes gained majors, right? I, I I get a lot of questions about this, and people love this, right? They, they want to see guys and how they play at major championships, and I think it's fair, right? They're the the toughest fields in golf. They're, they're, they're playing for the biggest prizes, and you get just, yeah, some, some elite level stuff. So what I've done is everybody in this field dating back to 2012 in the four major championships, and... Zalatoris is one, Scotty is two. Now, they've got smaller sample sizes. Uh, Zalatoris only has 33 rounds in major championships, but he's gaining 2.37 strokes per round. Scotty Scheffler, a little bit more, 46 rounds. He's gaining over two. Those are the only two golfers gaining two strokes per round. Then, Rory. Yeah, I've heard of him. 152 rounds, 1.96. Here's Colin Morikow. This is what I'm talking about. I know he's already got two major championship victories, but he's been great in the other ones as well. 44 rounds, 1.93. Don't forget about Dustin Johnson. Dustin Johnson is fifth on this list. $8,800. He's in the range that we are getting into right now. 1.92 strokes gained per round. The last major championship he played feels like an eternity ago. T6 at the Open Championship. 24th at the U.S. Open last year as well. He missed the cut at the PGA Championship and finished 12th at the Masters. That was his 2022. Just because he's been out of sight, out of mind, does not necessarily mean he has fallen off a cliff. And if there is anybody in the world who does not care about coming back and and like having to deal with any questions he might get about joining live. I, I, I think Dustin Johnson just like does not care. Now we have the same problem with trying to determine his recent results and how good they are. So he played live Orlando. He finished seventh. He, f- he played live Tucson 13th and T 35 in Mayakoba. But if you look at his larger live golf career, it's, it's great, right? He won it. He won Boston. He won Bedminster. He had a, or excuse me, he won Boston. He won Miami. He had a runner up in Bedminster. He had a third in Chicago, a fifth in Jetta. He's only had one result uh, outside the top 15. Now I know they're only 48, 48- 48 person fields, but uh, like, listen, put some guys in front of them, see what happens. So DJ, I think for me on, you know, early in the week here, very early in the weekend, in a week like this, things move fast. They move quick. A lot changes. This is the, this is the live guy I'd be interested in. $8,800 Dustin Johnson at about 9.8% ownership. Uh, a lot of the ownership in the $8,000 range going to the guys at the bottom. It's your it's your Will Zalatoris, your Sung J.M., your Victor Hovland, your Hideki Matsuyama. Um, so in a situation where Camp Smith was expensive and highly owned, Dustin Johnson is reasonably priced and lower owned. Like, yeah, that that's the situation that I want. I would be pretty surprised if Jason Day's projected ownership stays this low 7.9 percent he's eighty seven hundred dollars he is arguably one of the hottest players in the world right now you know he had um another great finish at the match play he gets into the final four he finished uh top 20 at the players the api riviera phoenix farmers american express i mean it has been just a an unbelievable stretch of golf to put this um into into a better perspective for you so let me do the last 36 rounds for everybody in this field and we'll see um scotty shuffler john rom rory mcelroy the big three are your top three jason day is fourth now if we go to the weighted side of things so the weighted side of things takes into account um strength of field and a variety of other factors so you'll see those guys those senior tour guys like they drop like rocks here right because the strength of field and and how hard those courses are is not not the same. So it's the same four guys, Scotty Scheffler, John Rom, Rory McIlroy, Jason Day. And Jason Day actually gets a pretty big, pretty big boost here. There's a, there's a bigger gap between four and five here in the weighted stuff than there was in the raw stuff. So really love the way Jason Day is playing right now. The other thing that I did want to look at was the last 36 rounds of, let me get the senior guys out of here. Um, and, and look at the strokes gained distribution for this range. So this is a, a tool that allows you to look at how often golfers are gaining 
X number of strokes to the field, zero, one, two, three, four, and five. So you're looking at a floor, you're looking at a ceiling. So here's Jason Day, 8,700. He is gaining strokes to the field 72% of the time. That is uh, basically, it's better than Jordan Spieth. It's basically on par with John Rahm. Actually, let me sort it like, sort it this way by salary. It'll be a little bit easier to see. So Jason Day gaining strokes to the field, any any number of strokes, basically on par with John Rahm. Gaining one or more 66% of the time, basically on par with John Rahm. Gaining two or more 47% of the time, a little bit worse than John Rahm, better than Patrick Cantlay, basically the th fourth best mark in the field. Same thing for 36, or for three plus, for four plus, and for five plus, and actually, in terms of five plus, uh, he's gaining five or more strokes more often than Rory McIlroy is. So, I, I do think it is fair to say that Jason Day is up there with the big three statistically, right? Statistically, he's up there with the big three. I do want to just close out one thing and show you his Masters history here, just before we move on. He missed the cut in each of his last two, but before that, it was T five, T twenty, T twenty two, T ten. Third place finish back in 2013, runner-up in 2011. This Jason Day, the 2020 and the 2021 version of Jason Day, was not the version of Jason Day we are seeing right now. I can go back through his results and show you. He was just not playing as well. So hold on, where's the 2022 uh, Masters? Oh, I'm sorry. 20, he didn't even qualify for the Masters last year. That, that's how poorly he was playing. He didn't even qualify for the Masters in 2022. His 2021 Masters is here. That was the first of three straight missed cuts. He wasn't playing particularly great before that. The ball striking numbers weren't really there. The putter was kind of saving him a little bit. And then, remember, that was the short turnaround. And he had a T7 in Houston, but before that, it was horrible play. The approach play wasn't there. The T to green play was like... That not the same J day, so I, I can write off those two uh, those two missed cuts pretty quickly. Uh, you, you cannot play them all here. Um, the two that I would like at the bottom of this range are probably Hideki, understanding that there is a ton of risk there, and Sung J M, eighty one hundred dollars with with uh, much less risk. I want to look at Hideki's round by round stuff from last week because th this guy's just an absolute nut, and he's so hard to predict here. So he goes, okay, this is a good sign. He gained strokes off the tee in each round last week, basically a stroke per round, um, which is really impressive approach play. He was either a zero or a gainer. Great. Around the green, I don't care as much about. He's historically pretty good. And then the putter was, was fine. Okay. So this is a pretty optimistic stat profile. He also, Going back to um, one round at the match play, or one match at the match play before he withdrew. He actually played two, and then he withdrew. And the Players' Championship, he has now gained strokes off the tee in nine of his last ten. That's a pretty good sign. Because I'll pull up his stat profile, uh, and you'll see there's a lot of red off the tee here. And now we've got ten straight rounds, or nine out of ten, of him gaining off the tee. That's a pretty good sign. Approach... Not the pure flushing Hideki that I would like to see, but not bad. Generally better than average. The short game is all over the place. He might gain two and a half strokes putting. He might lose three. He might gain two around the green. He might lose two. That part is super scary, but at least, God, I will talk myself. I'm going to talk myself into this because the part, that part is at least pretty experience driven at Augusta National, right? I'm not as worried about it because you get like, like on in a bigger picture, Tiger is like two shots better than everybody else based on how much he knows this golf course, where to hit it and where not to. And you'll see. So in the last two years, Sadeki's gained like 10 strokes around the green and he lost three strokes putting last year, but gained two the year before that and gained a half a stroke putting in uh, 2019. So if there was a time or place for him to use a little bit of experience to boost those short game numbers, it would be now. Sung Jay is the other one. 
Uh, Sung Jae's got the runner-up finish in 2020. He missed the cut in 2021, very ugly. And then he finished eight in 2022. I just love what he's doing. You know, the well-rounded nature of his game, but the still the just elite ball striking numbers, the uh, around the green play, which is just as good as anybody. And then he can get hot with the putter is just, it's just splendid stuff. I don't think there's any reason to, to overthink this, but, um, Really interested to see what Hideki is in the live chat on on Wednesday as far as as far as projected ownership goes. The seven K range, and boy, this is where things go sideways, right? I mean, these this is where some of the big pricing discrepancies are. This is where you get a lot of the live guys uh, in here that we don't really have a lot of of, of information on. Um, I I honestly I honestly kind of think there's like 12 guys who can win this golf tournament. I, I don't know if any of them are in the 7K range. It's possible. Obviously, you know the Masters has a way of getting tight on Sunday in most cases, but I, I think we're just trying to find value here. So, boy, where do we even start? Um, I don't mind Joaquin Neiman. Okay, let's let's start let's start there. I I think that. The the three guys from Live who have uh, the best chance of making noise this week are are Cam Smith, Dustin Johnson, and and, and Joaquin Neiman. Um, Neiman's twenty twenty three Live season's been fine. It's been below average. T eleven thirty six and thirty first. His his Live season last year was a lot better. He didn't win, but he piled up top ten finishes. And then what I like is you know the last time we saw him, or last time we got measured events. He was just a, a ball striking fiend, right? I mean, eleven strokes on approach at the Memorial, and he gained on a excuse me gained ball striking um, from he has gained ball striking technically every event dating back to uh, the Masters of last year. Now, half of those events are not measured because they're live golf events, but you you get my point. It's just he's just a a stout ball striker who has a lot of different shots and. Um, has at least a little bit of experience around Augusta National. He finished uh, 40th and 35th in each of the last two years. He played this, I believe, as um, an amateur in 2018 and missed the cut. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna beat him up over that. The other, the other thing that I think people are gonna work themselves into a lather over is, is Brooks Kepka here, and, and I get it, right? He's 7,600 dollars. The pricing came out uh, well before. He played the Live Golf Orlando event in which he won. So now Brooks Kepka is going to enter the Masters off of a victory. And he's very cheap. And I showed you the Strokes Gate Major Championship numbers earlier. And his name is front and center. I think this feels a little trappy. Um, you know, there's always that guy who's everyone agrees is mispriced, and then everyone plays him. And if you look at his um, master's history, you know, he's missed the cut in each of his last two. So he doesn't have a top 10 here since 2020. It was a couple years ago. And we know the injuries have been piling up. We know the poor play has been piling up. I guess you just have to decide how impressive a win at Jetta, Live Golf Jetta, and a win at, in Orlando is. And does that outweigh a 46 at the Saudi International and a missed cut in Oman? And a T27 in Mayakoba? I don't know. I just think, you know, if we're putting if we're putting guys in quadrants, Cam Smith, expensive, highly owned. Brooks Kepka, cheap, but highly owned. Uh, Dustin Johnson, reasonably priced and low owned. That's the one I want. That's the one I want. Uh, the other guy. What's also interesting is the other guy. So the the seventy six hundred the seventy six hundred dollar range is like crazy, right? So you've got Minwoo, who finished fourteenth here last year and had that run at the Players Championship. He'll probably catch some steam. Kepka, who we've already talked about, will catch some steam. Corey Connors, fresh off victory, will catch some steam. So, so the two guys, the two guys that won last week were both set are both seventy six hundred dollars, and their pricing was set before last week, obviously. And then Corey Connors has phenomenal history around Augusta National. He's got three straight top tens. Uh, T eight T T ten T eight T six. So probably what's that mean? T four. T4 this week. Um, and if you look at it, you know, he gained strokes putting last year. 
uh, just one. Gained four and a half around the green. He's that drip putter. He's that defensive putter. I get it. Uh, absolutely knocked the cover off the ball at the Valero. He gained less than a half a stroke putting at the Valero Texas Open. Just absolutely phenomenal stuff. So I get it. The, these two guys are probably just like, they're just going to end up being super trappy is what I, is what I think is going to happen with Kepka and um, Corey Connors. If you, if you find yourself needing to play them, I think you are going to have to find a, a way to get pretty creative in some, in some other scenarios. Let me point out a couple of other um, notables here. Bryson. The Bryson fall from grace is, is shocking. So his run at the end of his PGA Tour career was horrid. Now, he was dealing with a wrist or a hand injury. He ended up getting surgery on it at some point. But since joining Liv, um, it hasn't gotten that much better, right? I mean, you look at what he's done since since the last season ended. So he played the Saudi International. He missed the cut there in, in epic fashion. He lost six strokes to the field in two rounds. He then um, barely beat half the field in Mayakoba, T23, Finished nearly dead last in Tucson, lost eight and a half strokes there, and then finished T16 last week in Orlando. Now, remember the infamous phrase when he said, oh, Augusta Nationals, that's a par 67 for me? Yeah, not so much, bud. Um, his best finish was as an amateur. Or uh, was he low amateur or was it his first time? I can't remember. I think he was an amateur that year. T21 in 2016. Missed the cut last year. T forty six. I mean, it's just it's just a lot of like middle results. And now he's playing the worst golf that he's played probably in quite some time. I'm not sure that there is, you know, this is a golf course. Um, you know, we talked about it. Could 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 if we contrasted the results between Jordan Spieth and and Brooks Kepka at Augusta National, they are. Uh, on the same ends of the spectrum as as these two guys' playing styles are, right? You know, Bryson's the mechanic. You know, he is the guy who is trying to remove variables. Jordan Spieth is the artist. Jordan Spieth is playing by feel. Bryson doesn't want to play by feel, ever. And Augusta National is a canvas, and you've got to be the artist. And I don't think the mechanic can... Paint on the canvas. Is that, I felt like Michael Scott. I didn't know where I was going with that. And I was just hoping to find it along the way. Hopefully that makes sense. But I just don't necessarily believe the style of golf that Bryson plays lends itself well to a highly creative golf course like uh, Augusta National is. Okay, I can't wait any longer. Let's talk about the big cat. Tiger Woods, which is shocking that he is like storyline five this week. It's absolutely crazy. So I followed Tiger at Riviera. Almost I, every, every day I saw a lot of tiger and I'll tell you what, I was pretty impressed by it. Um, you know, for him to make his first start f since the open championship. So what was that? Seven months, seven and a half months, something like that. And to make the cut finish T 45 at a golf course that is demanding in a field that was very strong and to gain two and a half strokes on approach. I was impressed. The shots that I saw him hit. I was impressed. Obviously he had some things he needed to clean up, obviously. Um, but that's his, that was his best driving week since August of 2020. Now we know there's been the crash, like a lot has happened since then. That was only 10 starts ago, but it was his best driving week since the FedEx St. Jude in 2020. It was his best approach week since the BMW championship in 2020. So like basically since this comeback, um, it, it was one of his better around the green weeks. He only lost a stroke around the green. And it was kind of one of his better putting weeks. We've seen him hemorrhage strokes around the greens. So I'm, I'm actually fairly optimistic. You know, maybe he finishes 32nd or something like that. I think that would be a win. But um, I, I said it before, no one, no one gets the experience bump like Tiger gets. Played here last year, and I mean, it was a full on limp every day. Obviously, uh he still has that little hitch in his gait, but he is he is clearly much stronger now than he was. I mean, I watched him walk all four days of Riviera. You it got it kind of got ugly on the weekend at 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 the Masters last year and he finished 47th. I am actually pretty optimistic that he that he beats that this year. I'm 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 pretty optimistic he could finish inside the top 30. Uh I don't know if he can contend. I I no idea, but I've not been this optimistic for Tiger in 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 probably quite some time, but don't don't get me wrong. I don't think he's going to win it, 
I'm just saying like relative to everything else that we've seen. The only other one that I'd throw out there is Chris Kirk. Chris Kirk is playing some unbelievable golf right now. You know, he had that win earlier this uh, year, a couple weeks ago at the Honda Classic. He finished 10th at Valero. He had those uh, back-to-back third place finishes to, to start the year. So he's playing great golf and he hasn't played the Masters in a while, but he does have experience. It, it was 2014, 2015, 2016. That was the last time he qualified. But it was a T20, a T33, and a missed cut. So at least he's been around here, right? It's not like he's coming in blank slate. He's got a couple of years under his belt, and he's playing some of the best golf that we've seen him play, honestly, probably since that time. And uh, he's right at, is he $7,000? He's at $7,100 worth taking a, a, a gander at if you're, if you're down in that range. Okay, the 6K range, I need to take a look at, at Gooch here because this is the guy that I was so surprised left for live because he was trending on being a really, really good um, PGA Tour player and to play in a lot of major championships and and a great ball striker and all that fun stuff, and, and then we lost it. I'll tell you what, it's not that bad. You know, he had a rough stretch after the BMW. I guess when he originally... No, that would not have been when he originally went to live. But he had this rough stretch here at the end of 2022. His 2023 has been better. So he won, he won Live Golf Miami. That was the last event of the year. I thought... I thought Dustin won that. Oh, that's a team event. That's why it's showing up there as a win. It's a, that's the that's the team event. Okay, so he was with the four aces. He's not with the four aces anymore. So that's why DJ has the win there and Taylor Gooch has the win. I guess Pat Perez and Patrick Reed have the win there as well. Um, sorry, apologies. Forgot about that. But otherwise, back to individual play. Finished 12th at the Saudi International. That was a full field event. Gained seven and a half strokes there. T11 in Mayakoba. 13th in Tucson, T16 in Orlando. So slightly better than average in all of those. And he finished, I think, 14th here last year. So I, yeah, he did. Uh, 14th here last year. Gained five and a half strokes uh, in the uh, with the putter. I don't mind that. I also don't mind Danny Willett. So that 2016 win was crazy and probably... I mean, I'm not going to say it wasn't deserved, but like, it's just like wild stuff. Look at how he's playing right now. So he's made five cuts in a row. Uh, none of them are particularly great finishes. T18 was his best, but that was at Riviera. Gain strokes on approach in four straight. Has gained strokes around the green in five straight. He's a zero off the tee, if not slightly better. He's a positive putter. You Obviously, he has the experience around here. After he won the Masters, he missed a bunch of cuts in a row. And that's kind of normal. He probably had a little bit. I'm not going to diagnose the guy, but probably had a little bit of like imposter syndrome, right? Um, T25 in 2020, he missed the cut in 2021, but he finished 12th year last year. So his last three years have gotten better. They've been trending in the right direction for Willett, and he's playing pretty good golf right now. I would not mind Danny Willett at $6,600. Charles Schwartzel's down here. He's played okay on live, right? He won, um, didn't he win early? Yeah, he won, he won like the very first live golf event. But this year he finished 13th in Qatar, uh, 12th in the Saudi International. He's played okay on Live, but his another guy who's got a green jacket. But his recent Masters run has been solid. 10th last year, T26 and T25. So basically three straight top 25s. Obviously the win. Another third place finish in 2017. Playing decent golf. I will. I will because uh, I'm sure people will want to see it if they haven't been paying attention. Here's Phil Mickelson's stat profile. It's not pretty. I mean, he's hemorrhaging strokes uh, even at these live golf events. And before he left for live, it was even worse on the PGA Tour. So tough to see. Um, again, just kind of shameless plug here for rickrungood.com. If you notice that's PGA Tour data, Corn Ferry data, uh, Asian Tour data, Senior Tour data, live golf data, and I'm missing one more. There's six tours. And PGA Tour data, maybe that's the one I was missing. So it gives you the complete picture of everything that's happening, and you can use that data throughout, and you can use it here in the custom model. I've made some big updates. This allows you to apply weights to any factors that you want, like hundreds of different factors, and then um, generate lineups with it. So here we go. We're going to build a model, uh, an early model for the 2023 Masters. How good is that? So we are going to go. So what, what do we know? Well, we said... Um, we said for off the tee stuff, we want you to be long um, and we want you, okay, so I'm going to do uh, 
12 on driving distance. We want you to be great on approach. So let's do strokes gained approach last. Um, I think I kind of want like a longer time frame for, for this this week. So let's say strokes gained approach last 50, 20 weights on that out of our 100. Around the green, I need you to be pretty stout. So let's say strokes gained around the green last 24. I'm going to do 15 there. And then um, putting, I'm going to do like long-term putting, but I'm not going to do much on it. So let's do strokes game putting last 50, just eight there. Then what I'll do is I'm going to go right down to course history and we're going to put um, 10 on strokes gained Augusta National and we are going to put five on strokes gained Kapalua because they're both... Um, you know, uneven golf courses, a lot of a lot of tricky lies, undulations, stuff like that. We are then going to should we do course types, hard, medium, long? Should we do slow group? We could do actually we could do this. Um put five on strokes, gain fast greens. Let's go. How good are these? Actually, you know what I could do? Let me take off. I'll do I'll do stroke five on strokes gain fast, five on bent grass, and then I'll I'll knock down our strokes gained putting last 50 and we'll just do it. We'll just do it the other way. Um, okay. So now I've got, I've got 28 weights to go. I want to do, uh, we are playing a fantasy game. So I could do fantasy points gained. I could do 10 there. I'll do five on implied win percentage and I will do, so I've got 13 left. Oh, you know what I want? Here's what I want. I want to put some on high upside golfers. So I'm going to put four on strokes gained total three plus four on strokes gained total four plus and my final five on strokes gained total five plus. That is one hell of a model. I better save this before I forget. So I'm going to save this and call this 2023 masters. You can now save these, download it, import it, anything you want. We're tracking the ownership. I've got a ton of new stats in here and it's just, it's just great. All right. Well, to the surprise of basically no one, my top three golfers are the big three. Now they are in a different order. They're in the opposite order that I gave them, uh, which is my, the, my ranking order here is Rom McElroy Scheffler. I told you earlier, I think it's probably Scheffler, Rory, and then Rom. So there you go. Jordan Spieth is number four for me. So that's that's higher than Cam Smith, for example. Jason Day is five. He's $1,000 cheaper than Jordan Spieth is. So what does that say? It means he's probably a pretty darn good value. Xander is six. Cantlay, seven. JT, eight. Zalatoris, nine. Colin Morikawa, 10. We didn't talk about him. Cam Young is 12. That's kind of interesting. Hideki's 15. I'm just kind of looking at some notables here, just kind of scrolling down the list. Like, where is Cam Smith? Probably not very high, right? And the live guys, you know, they don't get a lot of help with the lack of stats, right? So DJ was number 27 for me. Um, I mean, Tom Hoagie was was 24. They, the live guys are just, they, they struggle with that. So if you did want to run, Tiger's 31. So if you did want to run one and really consider Cam Smith 45, like those live guys, just stick with the strokes gain total numbers. Every, no matter what tour you're on, no matter what, everybody has strokes gain total numbers. So if you just wanted to use strokes gain total to get those live guys in there, um, fairly or do weighted strokes gain total that is all that is in there every single round for every single player has that even if live doesn't do strokes gained off the tee or they don't do good drive percentage or they don't do anything like that so keep that in mind so this is pretty interesting no surprise it's the big boys right but um i think it confirms my love for jordan spieth and jason day also makes me a little bit worried about like um guys that i were a little i was a little bit higher on like um like Dustin Johnson a little bit, but I think he can kind of flip the switch. Corey Connors, 33rd for me. Interesting. So that's that's the model. We can run it again on Wednesday. I might want to just de decrease the number of craziness in here, but hey, it's a lot of fun. When, when you have it available, uh, I'm going to use it. Okay, that's rickrungood.com. Giant golf database for fantasy, betting, fantasy golf and, and, and golf betting with great tools. I hope you enjoyed it. You should sign up. 
I love it. I'm always making improvements. I know you'll love it too. Um, live chat is Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern time, Rick Run Good YouTube channel. There is the betting preview on Tuesday, and there's going to be a lot more content along the way. So stoked for this week. Cannot wait for it. Best of luck, and I'll talk to you guys soon.